Now, uh, some sources at the UN are telling us that maybe one way to unlock this and to, to, to a way out would be to have voluntary uh, nationally uh, mitigation actions, nationally um, admitted uh, uh, mitigation actions, uh, NAMAS, yes, uh, yes. And, and in order to then have um, enough uh, emissions reduction in the package so that it becomes legally binding. That's another problem there. The developing countries in general, the G77, say they are willing to make those undertakings, but they are not willing to accept international, external, externally binding obligations. Whereas the United States, among others, says, well, countries like China, they, they, its undertakings have to be externally binding and uh, at least be verifi verifiable. Uh, so between the United States and, and China, but I suspect between other develop, developed countries and some of the bigger developing countries, one of the big issues is that question of accepting uh, legally binding uh, undertakings. Because India says it will make internal, undertake internal uh, obligations or uh, internal programs aimed at reduction of emissions, uh, aimed at uh, uh, a relatively carbon free uh, development path. Both China and India and other developing countries say that. Uh, but others say, well, in the absence of quantitative targets and uh, legally binding undertakings, uh, those are, are meaningless. And so we, we still have to get to a position where uh, enough trust could be built so that from the point of view of the Secretary General, uh, as, as in the Kyoto Protocol, the developing countries are supposed to undertake their own uh, adaptation uh, and mitigation programs and, and uh, adopt uh, carbon-free or relatively carbon-free development paths. Uh, hence technology transfers, hence the need for funding. Uh, so those are really the issues that are, uh, are still outstanding, but, but there is no outright rejection on the part of any, anybody. Uh, it's the unwillingness to, to accept external binding undertakings on the part of the major markets countries, the bigger, the bigger developing countries, that is. That doesn't apply to the island countries, for instance, the little island countries, the least developed countries, and including most of the African countries. It really doesn't, doesn't apply. But uh, of course, we, we have to accommodate everybody because we are in the same global boat, uh, boat and uh, we all have to do our part. Indeed, let's hope it's going to, we're going to have an agreement. Now, I, I would like... We have agreement. People say that even in Kyoto, agreement was reached at the very last minute. Let's hope so. Yeah, the EU agreed on the energy and climate package yes. um, at the last I minute. With everybody to uh, to be as good as what they say because everybody is warning about the consequences of failure <laughs> and yet people are not coming forward
to take actions that will prevent that failure. Okay, now I wanted to ask you uh, one or two questions regarding uh, the impact of climate change in your own country, uh, in Botswana. It will be one of the countries that will be severely uh, hit. Uh, can you describe yes. already um, yes. how things are changing? Yes, well, Africa is one of the continents that is going to be most severely affected. And my own country within Africa is going to be severely affected, is being uh, most severely affected by climate change. To start with, we already have to put up with very high temperatures, very high temperatures, which in the worst years reaches up to 45 degrees Celsius. Generally, our temperatures has been hot in the range of 35 uh, in the hot season, 35 to 37. It now goes up to about 42. And therefore, when people talk about another degree and a half or even two, that's already too much for countries like my own. We are a semi-arid area which we are already which is already prone to drought and what we have experienced in recent decades is greater frequency of droughts so that almost every three years we have a prolonged drought and the pattern of precipitation has changed we have situations where during the rainy season the individual precipitation is heavier than normal so we have flooding, uh, heavy rainfall, uh, resulting in destructive flooding, and then it goes away. We end up with a drought year in which there were floods. So we're having the worst of both worlds, and it's already happening. Now it's already happening, and do you see any movement? We are talking a lot about mass migration happening, climate refugees being uh, displaced. Uh, uh, do you see that happening already, and do you think the international in community in, in, is... In Africa it is happening, you know. You know how, how it's, it's in the headlines. But in the case of my individual country, uh, fortunately, we happen to be a very small country, and therefore, for now, no, we don't have, we have internal mi migration into Botswana rather than people living in Botswana because of the small population and uh, or relatively not so bad per capita income, f for now at least. Okay. One last word. Um, your vision, where will we be in 2020? How do you see things happening? I share the dream of the Secretary General that the international community will do something about the impending danger that we face from climate change and that therefore 2020 will witness uh, the beginning of uh, evidence that we are arresting uh, the deterioration in the quality of our lives, that by 2020, global warming will, evidence will begin to show that it's, uh, it's being arrested, that uh, deforestation uh, has been mitigated, if not uh, totally stopped by then.